so that's enough of the announcements. You can find everything else on the website. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to our audience, Ted, and take it away with Henrik Grossman. Thank, thanks very much. Thanks very much for having me on. Um, yeah, so the book is out um, at the end of next month. And basically, it's, it's about uh, Henrik Grossman, who I would um, describe as the best defender of Marx's economic and revolutionary theory from the 20th century. So um, he was a Polish Jew um, living in the Austrian occupied part of, of um, Poland. And um, he um, grew up in quite a, a, quite a well-off family. And, but he was, you know, he was anti-occupation. He wanted, um, he was interested in national sovereignty and um, he started going to meetings held by socialists um, and he was quickly won to the cause and he, and he um, very quickly read all, uh, as much, you know, as much Marxist literature as he could get his hands on. And he, in his words, he quickly mastered it. Uh, so he was quite confident of his ability to, to, um, to grasp Marxist theory. Um, he joined the Polish Social Democratic Party, um, but he was quite dissatisfied with the direction of the party. Um, he felt it was a reformist party and he was also dissatisfied with the way it, um, it was neglecting Jewish people, uh, Jewish and especially Jewish workers. Um, it, its position was really an assimilationist one. It, it was, um, you know, Jew, Jewish people will, will be liberated after, um, after socialism. Um, and therefore there's no real need to concentrate on their, their own sort of um, specific day-to-day -day struggles. Whereas he saw it as both. Um, so he ended up breaking away um, from the Polish SDP and forming a, a, a Jew, an independent Jewish party. However, he wanted it to um, be affiliated to the general Austrian party um, but it was it was actually denied the the Austrian party actually denied that affiliation. Um, but he he carried he carried on with the party in a very non sectarian way. Um, he carried continued to support the Polish party and the um, the Austrian party. He would just criticise them um, for their lack of uh, of their their sort of narrow mindedness um, and their reformism. So he was very political, but it was later on that he he um, produced work that makes him a very significant Marxist um, to be aware of. Um, he moved to Vienna after the the working class struggles had died down um, in the wake of the First World War, um, and he worked under. Um, uh, was it? I've forgotten his name. Grunberg. Uh, Karl Grunberg, I think his name. I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> um, anyway, he so he ended up working at a university under Grunberg, who was the first um, German, uh, the first Marxist professor to to work at a German-speaking university. He became an expert in statistics, and he studied um, Galician. Uh, economic history, which was the part of Poland uh, that he was from. Um, but uh, he started writing Marxist essays about economic theory uh, and criticizing the, the established Marxist writers, such as Karl Kautsky, Hilferding, um, Otto Bauer, um, people who were writing um, commentary on, on Marxist uh, literature who were claiming to take Marxist literature forward 
or correcting Marx's economics theories and that sort of thing. Um, and what he basically ends up doing is defending Marx almost absolutely in that he feels that the criticisms that are being made by the likes of Otto Bauer and Hilferding, uh, Rosa Luxemburg are actually incorrect and they have, they misread Marx essentially. Uh, um, either willfully or not, we, we can obviously never know. Um, but he, so what he, what he, in general, what he states is that um, the critics of Marx who were supposedly taking Marx forward um, had based their analysis almost completely on volume two of Capital and ignored volume three. Now, obviously, volume three, there was a delay in its, in its publication. Um, but this, he didn't see this as an excuse. Um, as essentially, so what he's doing is he's, he's, exp he's, the, he's the first Marxist after Marx to explain the structure of capital accurately. So what Marx does is um, he, he has a method called successive approximation where he creates a pure version of capitalism, um, a, an abstraction where he studies uh, Marx's, uh, studies capitalism from a math, in a sort of arithmetical, mathematical, systematic way where he he isolates the key features of capitalism so there's no competition in his in his initial abstraction this is a provisional a provisional way of looking at capitalism a pure way so there's, there's no competition there's only two classes capitalists and workers there's a constant rate of surplus value uh, which is also a constant rate of, e of the rate of exploitation. Um, there's constant wages and constant, uh, constant rate of wages, which is the same thing in the table, in the schema that Marx is using. And there's um, a constant population growth. And Gross, what Grossman, Grossman does is, is he doesn't actually use, he doesn't re- uh, re just simply republish Marx's schema. He takes a schema used by Otto Bauer, who was an Austrian uh, Marxist. He was in the, the, the SDP, he was really a reformist. Um, so what ba Bauer does this, um, but he, and he, it, it's a fairly good schema. It, it shows that the, the cap, that the, what, what, what we've, might refer to as the organic composition of capital or constant capital relative to variable capital is hot. So the constant capital is, is higher. Um, it grows faster. So Bauer has it growing at 10% and he has the population of workers growing at 5% per year or, or per rotation or whatever you want to call it. And so Bauer does this and but he stops after four years or four cycles. And after four cycles, he's left with a scheme showing that the, the rate of profit is slowly falling, but that the, um, the accumulation is rising, absolutely. And the consumption fund of the capitalists is rising, absolutely. So he sees no problem. And Grossman says, hang on a minute, what happens? Essentially, all he's saying is, what happens if we actually carry on with the very schema that you have produced and gross Grossman finds that after 36 years, the system actually breaks down. You get a, what he calls an over accumulation of capital or an overabundance of capital along with um, a surplus of labor that can't be employed. So you can't employ the, the surplus of capital that arises in reinvestment and you can't re-employ these workers so the 
therefore the only way of um, continuing the schema is to change um, change the the rate of surplus value or um, slow down the 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 rate of accumulation you have to, you'd have to change those stipulations and start varying them to get the accumulation going again without having that surplus of capital and surplus of labor so this is this is this is what he calls a breakdown theory in Marx. And although he says Marx didn't speak of a theory of breakdown per se, he did speak of breakdown, but he also didn't really speak of a theory of wages, yet we do speak about a theory of wages and so on and so forth. So, so Grossman is, um, is clarifying what Marx's theory was. Now, so Otto Bauer and Hilferding and later on Kalkowski, they they believe that from their schemas that, that capital can accumulate harmoniously without crisis and uh, that the, the only thing that can cause crisis is a misallocation of... Um, of capital in some way so it, as long as it the system is properly planned it can it can go on forever without crisis so they would term this uh, under an under consumption theory on the one hand where the working class isn't being paid enough to afford the the um the products the commodities that they're that they're um that they're manufacturing uh, which means that profit is then not realised because uh, profit is realised in the sale. Although it, it stems from the exploitation of labour, it, it is realised in the sale of commodities. Um, and the other, the other theory was disproportionality theory, which is again a misallocation of, of labour where it's uh, of capital where it's there's too much in one sphere of industry compared to another. And so supply and demand is out of kilter. But that, again, from their perspective, can just be um, put put right by reforming things here and there and, and planning. So that, that was one side of it. The other side of it was that he, um, he reintroduces an analysis of, of the commodity per se as, and its dual character. Um, they, so they, they had analysed um, capitalism from the value side. So they, they take volume two and they treat Marx's abstractions, uh, his, his abstract schema as empirical reality. They think Marx is treating the abstraction as empirical reality, whereas that's not what he's doing. He does that in, in chapter three. Uh, in volume three, where he introduces more and more variations uh, to the schema um, and see, and tries to bring the schema closer and closer to empirical reality to see if the initial findings, i.e. the breakdown tend tendency, continue um, once or and how that is affected once you're bringing the schema back closer by reintroducing the elements that were um, that were initially discarded and so so the other thing that Grossman's doing is reintroducing an, an analysis of the effect that use values per se is a commodity is a use value it's a utility as useless. sorry <laughs> Um, and it, yeah, so it has utility, it has a use value, but it's also an exchange value. They had really, Marx's critics on the left had really only analysed the value side of things. They hadn't really analysed the effect of uh, an expansion in use values, for example. So if you double the amount of use uh, use values, each one of those use values will have half the va will tend to have half the value in it than it did before that.
So he, he's reintroducing that side of things. Um, and, and in this, he's at pains to stress that the, the organic composition of capital is constant to variable capital, but it's also uh, means, of lab, uh, means of production to living labour, which is the technical composition. So the, the, you've got the, the value composition, which is constant, to va constant capital to variable capital, and the technical composition, which, of, which is means of production to living labor. They both tend to rise in the favor of, of the former, constant or means of production, but they're not exactly the same thing. The, 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 the means of production is obviously the mass of mass material of machinery but the constant capital is the value of that mean of the means of production so so those are the sorts of things that Grossman's tackling um he's trying to um he's trying to bring he's trying to uh, re-establish what Marx was really saying he's defending Marx he's exposing the the flaws in in these other theories and not just in reformists in in communists as well where he was critical of rosa luxemburg's um books on accumulation um he was he was very critical of um geno varga who was the chief economic advisor for stalin um he, he was essentially saying that no one had had understood Marx at this point in time, even Lenin. I think he, I think he thinks Lenin is probably closer than anyone else, but he, he's quite critical of Lenin's imperialism because it doesn't really explain the theory that compels capitalists to export capital ever more frequently. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the general. He he wrote a lot of other stuff as well, but I think the the law of accumulation and the breakdown of the capitalist system was his his most influential work. He produced it when he went to work. He was exiled from Poland uh, from Poland, and he worked for the uh, the Frankfurt School in uh, in Germany, and that's when he produced it. But he was the only one there really tackling the economic side of things most the marxists working there were, were more interested in the f philosophical side of things um but but that was the most read work the the, the institute produced um and it was incredibly controversial it was almost universally um denounced on the left whether that's the reformist side or the revolutionary side um yeah um so he was a bit of a one man band <laughs> and uh, but he's very very important and i think the i think what you have to um what you have to take from it is that he he does establish a what i would i mean he i think he demures from this but i think he does establish a final breakdown theory um i think he shows that capitalism does have to end that it does have to have a, a final breakdown by definition he he said he he talks about the counter tendencies to the breakdown tendency but they first and foremost they are uh they they flow out of the breakdown tendency that the breakdown tendency compels the capitalists to um to do everything that they need to do to counter the breakdown tendency. But at the end of the day, it's part of the same piece of elastic. Um, and so they, they have to, they have to, um, they have to gradually exhaust themselves over time and become less and less effective because of course, as capitalism gets bigger, it needs to generate more and more surplus value. Um, and that just becomes more and more difficult as time goes on. Um, I, I suppose I've summed it up as much as I as I as I probably should at this point. Do you want to come back on any of that? Well, um, 
Ted, there is, uh, I would definitely like you to uh, go into more of, of what Grossman uh, did in his career and to explain more, but it would be good to have some questions and comments right now. And if, the, if anyone has a question, please write the word stack over in chat or raise your hand with the feature and the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, and I'll give a minute before jumping in myself with a question. Okay, Richard Myers, go ahead. Yes, uh, Ted. Um, since I'm not really too familiar with Grossman, um, could you elaborate a little bit more on how he might uh, be similar or differ uh, from other people who what? have uh, seen yeah, that capitalism would have a final websites. breakdown? I think you said that he's not the only one that has held that view, but is there, are there significant differences or similarities with people we might be more familiar with that would help us to sort of place him? Yeah, so Rose, Rosa Luxemburg um, had a final breakdown theory and Grossman was complimentary to her for that, for, for, for defending the idea that Marx had a breakdown theory. He, he called it her great contribution. Um, but it wasn't the correct version. It wasn't accurate. So her, so her theory was that mar was that capitalism needed non-capitalist markets to expand into um to export commodities to because she saw she, so she in her in her assessment of marx's work she thought that he was actually that he had actually found uh, a saturation of um commodities in a given nation so what so what happened then was that the, the capitalist country was then compelled to um, export commodities elsewhere to non-capitalist markets. But she saw that eventually everywhere would be industrialized and turned into uh, a capitalist society. And so eventually capitalism would run out of um, non-capitalist markets to expand into. But of course, this situates the problem at the level of consumption and that's only half the story the, the 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 more important half is the is production where surplus value actually originates from and so that's that was that was grossman's uh chief criticism of of luxembourg's work and Karl kautsky uh, the the early kautsky shared more or less shared uh luxembourg's view of, of why there would be a final breakdown Later on, Kautsky rejected breakdown theory entirely and became uh, a neo-harmonist, along with the likes of Bauer, who, who thought that the capital could accumulate harmoniously without crisis or breakdown. Does that, does that help? Richard? Yes. Uh, yeah, that does help. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Uh, George, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, Ted, I, I wish um, if you could, uh, I think where I'm lost a little bit is in within the mathematical models that you're not showing, I guess. And yeah, it's how, difficult. Uh, and, and so that, that's, that's, that's where I'm a little bit lost there. And it's, and it's reaching way back in my memory. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, would, that would be helpful if you could compare him to uh, the others. But an old question of mine when I dropped out was uh, – was in my memory was crises not also uh, tied into uh, fixed capital or long cycles like 30 guys I, I was remembering 30 year cycles for fixed capital and then 10 and then three and thinking now maybe none so those are my one is a request for the math and the other one is just a question about the uh, cycles thank you I mean, thank you yeah. I mean, it's difficult to go into the math without like using charts and um, and stuff. The, the, the biggest problem I have is that I don't have um, the full version of Grossman's book. I've got a, um, 
I've got the abridged one. Let me see if I can find something quick. So what? So what he does is so he's using Bauer's scheme, and he, as I say, he isolates each of the 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 most necessary components of of capital. So he starts with a t with a with a table which divides capital between um, constant capital and variable capital. And then each one incre increases at a constant rate. So constant capital is increasing at a uh, temp rate of 10% per cycle and variable capital, which is labor or the population at 5% because you have to do that because that's we know from empirical reality in in a in a capitalist society or not in a capitalist society machine the amount of the the amount of machinery um per laborer will tend to increase over time as we innovate and expand production um that will continue in a socialist uh society it, it did continue in you know in the socialist in the soviet union um and elsewhere um so so then the the um the, the figure, so let's say, I think it's 80,000 uh, with constant capital and 20,000 um, in um, with variable capital. And so you have to to add the 10% per year in the constant capital and then the 5% with the variable capital each cycle. And so you get a new number at the end of each cycle. But that number has to be, has to cover a certain amount going to towards additional capital and additional variable cap uh, capital if and that that's what accumulation is that's what the the accumulation of capital is and then there also needs to be um, an amount that goes to the consumption of the capitalists because that's the incentive for being a capitalist so all of those rates are constant in the in the pure version in the abstract version and so you follow, he follows the mathematical pattern by just, you know, t adding the 10% per cycle and, and sees if that continues harmoniously without any problems. But, but Bauer, only, so Bauer only does that for four years and it all looks hunky dory because even though there's a slight fall in the rate of profit, there's an absolute growth in additional uh, capital, constant capital additional variable capital and the consumption fund for the capitalist. So he walks away saying, look, there's no problem. Capitalism can go on indefinitely without crisis. But Grossman continues the cycle. And I mean, it, the, the, the breakdown that he discovers in year 36 would, would happen a lot earlier um, in, in reality because the, the, the constant capital to variable capital would be much higher. Like it's always, it always tends to get higher. Um, so the sort of the 10 to five ratio that, that Bauer's using is unrealistic, but it doesn't matter because you, to expose him, Gross, Grossman needed to, um, to use his own work. Um, he might, if he had been starting from scratch, he might have, he might have, you know, done 10 to one or 20 to one or whatever. Um, it probably a lot higher than that. Um, on the fixed capital, does that is that a bit clearer? Much oh, clearer. Sort of Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, forgive me for. Uh, well, go on on fixed it versus. Uh, yeah. So so later on in the analysis, he needs to reintroduce all of the elements that were um, originally discarded. So he needs to apply variations. Uh, that exist in the real world. So he, so he starts um, varying the rate of surplus value, varying the, you know, the, um, um, the rate at which constant capital is expected to grow, that sort of thing. Um, and he, so there's a very large, probably the largest chapter actually in the law of accumulation is, is the chapter on modifying counter tendencies. So he re he's reintroducing all the things one that were were weren't used weren't analysed to start with, 
and saying, how does this affect the breakdown tendency? Does it produce, does it help to produce more surplus value sooner, um, thereby delaying the breakdown tendency? Or does it have the opposite effect? Fixed capital has, has a, he, he, he shows that fixed capital has a two-sided effect. On the one hand, um, as time goes on, fixed capital, the quality of fixed capital rises. So it could last longer. It could be used for longer. Um, and and th in that sense, um, the, oh, I'm trying to figure <laughs> which way around it is. So there's that, there's that on, on, the, on, the, on the one hand. But on the other hand, we can inc increasingly innovate more quickly. So fixed, fixed capital, despite despite its endurance increasing, it's replaced sooner because, and this um, tallies with competition, uh, the, the leading um, monopoly capitalists need to, um, need to outcompete their competitors. And so they need to innovate. They need to produce um, new fixed, they need to innovate new fixed capital, despite the fact that the old, the the version in use hasn't um been used up yet or, or hasn't hasn't worn out so they need to replace it with something better despite that and so that has i think both of those things have uh effects on the counter on the breakdown tendency in both directions and it, and it, it will depend how much fixed capital is introduced um how much better it is at producing commodities per labourer, per labour hour, you know, that sort of thing. And before, before I go, so just to make sure we're not all confused, um, are we making a distinction between fixed capital and constant capital? Um, yes, yes. Constant capital is the value of the fixed capital. Okay. We're yeah. good. Thank you very much. That's all right. Thank you. So, Judith has left a, a link in the chat for everyone if you want to copy this. Judith, could you explain what that link is? It's okay. Um, yes, so it is a recommendation for you. So you can read uh, a text by Grossman and maybe you um, will conclude that um, he didn't support any breakdown theory and also Rosa Luxemburg um, didn't um, write a breakdown theory. I have to oppose in this sense. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Um, so, uh, Ted, in, I, I don't see anyone else on stack, so I'm just taking the floor. How, what are the countervailing tendencies towards breakdown? We are in a period where automation steps up to ever greater proportions everywhere on the planet. We, we, we at one time had the imperial poles with their client states. But what we are seeing now is practically every part of the world has, is being uh, in real, there's almost a real subsumption of labor everywhere on, on the planet now. The, the, that is very profound. And we do know that capital is aware of what practically the amount of minerals that are left, what is required with the, with the tremendous co computational powers and the tremendous uh, infrastructures of processing knowledge, capital through algorithms is able to forestall. One of the, the main areas where we see capital uh, forestall any like periodic crises is like these what we thought were newer uh, uh, formations like 
derivatives and hedge funds and these kinds of things. But in volume three, those are there. When, when you re read through Marx, he's already anticipated this mm. kind of phenomenon that capital would bring about. Yet it seems that there, that, and capital is incredibly good at discovering new marketplaces in their disasters they create. The, not just that there, there will be a divvying up between various large capitals of the two poles as the ice melts, but with every type of, of be it from war to other, the, the hyper development of one area, the, the desertification of another, capital finds ways to grow in the interstitial moments of the disasters they're creating. And there seems to be, uh, amongst the capitalist class, even though there's tremendous competition, there does seem to be a, a much more united international sector of capital than we have seen prior to this. I, I don't know if that's true. I, I mean, I live in one place. I don't travel very much, and I don't have time to do research. I have a job, and I do this. But the... Breakdown theory does seem to indicate that there would be a, a tipping, one big tipping point where suddenly we're going to be able to understand that we created all that constant capital. We as a class need to go and take it and buy buy capital. But I, I, there, there seems to be a lot between that moment and where we are today. So if you could comment a little on I mean, and, and at the same time, we have all kinds of predictions around the metabolic rate of destruction that capital is inducing on our planet, where we don't have that much time to resolve this crisis of capital uh, shredding the planet. Um, so I, I haven't formulated one question, but there seems to be a lot of strength in capital in in working against the the negative effects of the massive automation, et cetera. Now, yesterday's talk, uh, James was saying that with the various waves of automation we have seen from manufacturing period through industrial revolution forward, we do not see the massive unemployment that some cr uh, critical uh, analysts see coming that will create a crisis. And, and you and I were having a little chat about this, but I, I personally feel that the rate of automation is getting to a much higher point than we've ever seen. And, yeah. and tremendous uh, inherited skills, not just in our, our broad working classes, but the professional classes are being proletarianized at this point. Yeah. Um, and and I, I guess I'm bringing up a little too much to address in, in one reply, but it, it, could you speak a little to the, the countervailing tendency yeah. to the, the uh, breakdown of capital? I mean, that's, that's one of them, the proletarianization of, of, groups uh, that weren't, you know, that were more, were semi-proletarian or petty bourgeois um, turning, because what, what capital, so the, the key problem that, that Grossman finds is that the massive surplus value, there isn't enough of it to reproduce um, and expand the, the value of capital. So, on the one side, you've got the technical labor process, but, but under capitalism, it's also a valorization process. You need, the system needs to create enough value, profit, um, in the form of profit, to renew the value of the existing capital and expand it further. So that limits, that, that creates a fetter on productivity. So to overcome that breakdown in that relation, you get the countervailing tendencies. So what the, what the main one he, 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 um, he highlights, he highlighted a lot. He, he, he actually did highlighted more than Marx. The, but the main, 
one he highlights is devaluation. Now that can mean various things. You, you've got old forms of capital that where the, the companies go bust, for example, and that capital is devalued. Um, it can then be bought up on the cheap by other companies. And so they um, expand their production and the size of their companies cheaply. So that enables them to move forward. Um, the, the, the depression in prices that, cause what, cause what initially tends to happen with, as with the onset of, of a crisis is panic selling because the companies, the demand falls, the companies therefore cut their prices in order to sell their commodities that enables the, the wealthier companies to buy those commodities, which are also means of production. Uh, on the cheap so they can expand and innovate more cheaply than they would have been able to before the crisis. In fact, they wouldn't have been able to before the crisis because they wouldn't have been able to afford it. The prices would have been too high for the, for what they, for the investment they had available to them. So the crisis is, is not only inevitable, it's actually needed for capitalism to reach the next stage of accumulation. So devaluation is one of them. Um, an expansion in production is, is, is another because, again, even though um, there's less value, exchange value and profit contained in each commodity as production expands, that is offset by expanding production. So it's, it's dialectical. It's, it's, a, it's a unity of opposites. Um, uh, the devaluation itself reduces the value of labor power so that results in a in a, in a almost automatic um a fall in the the average wage the production of of or the breakdown producing surplus labor that can't be employed that weighs down on the rest of labor that is employed because the the capitalist can say you you're going to have to accept what I offer you because otherwise you're quite easily replaced because there's a reserve army of labor out there. So that depresses the wage and therefore increases the amount of um, value that the capitalist keeps. There are, there are more, there are a lot more, um, you know, reducing storage costs, you know, the incentives change with each crisis, you know, it's all at the, at the, um, at the surface level in the real world, the cost of production uh, needs to be pushed down through innovation. So I think, uh, and, and obviously all of that enables a monopol an increasing monopolization in the ownership of the means of production. You might get more companies, absolutely, but fewer will own the bulk and increasingly, increasingly so. Um, and the monopolization of, of uh, the tendency towards monopolization is very evident now. Um, I, th I think, uh, is it Vanguard and uh, BlackRock have the most shares in almost, you know, every company, uh, every, you know, monopoly corporation that you can think of um, now. Um, and there's other things going on, like between 1964 and 2014, the average lifespan of the 500 richest US companies shrank from around 60 to 18 years, 60 to 18. So you, you can see that something's going on there. Like there's a there's a integration that's got like a gradual in integration over time of the companies and, and all the, even before companies merge, they start working together just to cheapen their production costs. So if you look at um, a company like Toyota, it's increasingly reliant on other, on, on its, actually on its rivals for parts. If it's, if it's going to be able to afford the cost of producing certain cars, um, it, it has partnerships with, B, with BMW, for example, um, uses BMW engines in some of its in some of its cars, and 
on that subject, the city car is is disappearing because it's or it's not disappearing, but it's only being produced by a handful of companies now. Um, Toyota being the main one, so there's that sort of thing going on, and it and automating production is one of the countervailing tendencies because even though it removes increasingly moves labor from manufacturing and pushes labor into services um what it does is it increases the rate of productivity so those workers that are the remaining workers in um in manufacturing their the rate of their productivity in terms of output of commodities per labor hour worked is is increasingly high because the equipment they're using is increasingly automated um, and so that that for the time being is a counter tendency even though it's it's working again it's working in both directions on the one hand it's eliminating labor but on the other hand it's raising the productivity of labor so but that can't go on forever that's like you say there's going to be there's going to have to be a tipping point and i think we're getting closer and closer to it because of the amount of automation there is i mean the the deindustrialization that the the western capitalist powers experienced in the 80s is now almost complete on a worldwide basis um even sub saharan africa and and latin america spent the last decade deindustrializing and moving towards services based economies now workers in services do produce surplus value if they are handling um commodities or transporting commodities but if they don't then they then they don't produce surplus value they are paid out of the surplus value that is created by the productive workers this is a very interesting and um under theorized area because of course data is a commodity and it's actually the the most profitable commodity more so than oil now um so any um service worker who's producing data that is commodified will be producing surplus value but they will produce they will be producing very little surplus value per unit of data they produce because of course it doesn't take much labor time to produce any data uh, any or one unit of data so of course capital needs us to produce absolutely exponential amounts of data and and it needs to keep commodifying that data and it needs to keep finding outlets for that data and that's probably the hardest part when it comes to commodifying data because a lot of it's obviously business to business um and that that contributes to this integration you're talk of of capital that you're talking about as well um just on the the um the question of oil um and fossil fuel the energy return on investment has trended downwards from 100 to 1 in 1930 to to between 3 and 6 to 1 uh in 2019 and of course it will be a bit lower now or probably be a bit lower now so we can see there that foss- the fossil fuel industry is becoming unprofitable like completely unprofitable um we also know that it's probably the most indebted industry on the planet now um and fossil fuel has been absolutely vital to the continuation of capitalism because it's a labor intensive industry um it it takes a lot of work to extract oil from the earth and then process it into a commodity and even where that has become very highly capital intensive and automated the remaining workers are very highly exploited the rate of their exploitation is very 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 high um but the next step is in in trying to counter that that indebtedness is to eliminate more labor so that you're not you so that you're eliminating the amount the cost on wages because automation in the long run is cheaper you don't have to pay auto automated machinery 
uh, any wages or holiday pay. It doesn't go on toilet breaks or on holiday. It can work around the clock. So that's that. That's the gist of it. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, Grossman doesn't talk about automation because it's probably not looming large at the time. He talks about the means of production continuing to grow um, more and more in ratio to living labour and therefore it becoming harder and harder for living labour to valorise that ever-growing um, disproportionately large amounts of capital. But it's the same thing, you know, it's the same thing. And um, with automation, what we're seeing is, I think, uh, a very... Uh, what I would call a pre-socialist mode of production now where, you know, it's, it's, we're in state monopoly capitalism where the, the merge, the state and the monopoly enterprises are, are integrating ever more to offset the falling rate of profit. Um, but that's just laying the basis for what you might call state monopoly socialism because what we see in the means of production is an evolution, a constant evolution. Let's not forget, it's not just constant capital. Um, it's also means of production. And Grossman stresses the means of production um, grow under any, um, any mode of production uh, relative to the amount of labour. And of course, the quality of the means of production and its capacity grows as well. Um, so we're on the point of having, I mean, like I say, manufacturing labor has really been eliminated already and more or less, you know, in, in, in relative terms. And, um, so the, so the working class has become a services based working class. And I would say that that is that is a pre-socialist trend um, because not only does capitalism work towards a fully automated system of production, history does. Like we, we would still be doing this without capitalism because we're always going to want, like if we were, let's say we were already work, living in socialism, we would still innovate because that's what people do. We, we, we seek uh, we seek innovations that enhance the quality of life, that save labour, um, so that we can do other things that are more enjoyable. It's, it's just what we do, um, and so um, we would actually be more likely to innovate um, under socialism because we're not restricted by the value composition we're not restricted by the generate having to generate enough value we can just do it at the rate we're comfortable with um and you know, within the physical bounds of 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 reality um so but but with socialism you could do it without making people unemployed or impoverished whereas in capitalism to innovate and expand production, you have to make people unemployed, you have to reduce their wages, you have to evict them, you know, so on and so forth. So that tendency, the breakdown tendency, the, the final breakdown tendency, where you just, production has become so automated that it's, you're no longer actually producing enough surplus value there's no longer enough surplus labor time being created that the system will, will start collapsing and you will get, you will start, I mean, it's all going to happen. It's all going to start happening before it actually collapses in a way, because the more wages are pushed down, the more workers are going to start fighting back. You know, the more they're going to start occupying factories, uh, that sort of thing, you know, mass protests. Um, so it's, it, you know, Grossman doesn't say, oh, the system collapses and then there's a revolution. You know, he says these, 
these counteracting factors are uh, intermingling and and countering each other and, and fighting each other and that produces a, a revolutionary situation thank you ted i i do not want to ask any more of the many questions i have because there's so many people here who i would like to hear from so uh a, a gathered people, is there anyone with a question for Ted or by extension for Henrik Grossman? <laughs> yes, Bill Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ted, for uh, this uh, seminar. It's, it's very interesting. Um, you use the term pre-socialist society. Uh, what exactly does, if that's Grossman's term, what, what does he mean by that? And is a fully would a fully automated economy necessarily mean a socialist economy or just simply one that's non exploitive? And uh, would such a society then be perhaps that pre socialist society? Um, sorry, uh, sorry, pre, uh, pre socialist is a term that I'm using. It's not, it's not a term Gr Grossman used. It's just that when we started talking about automation, because it's so relevant now. Um, like I say, Grossman didn't really address it per se, but um, because Michael asked the question, um, I, I started, you know, I, I have this tendency to start rambling and going off on um, tangents, but um, yeah, pre-socialist, I think what we're, we see a lot of pre-socialist trends, which is uh, and one of them being the fact that the workforce no longer works in manufacturing, relatively speaking, um, um, and that it's become a services-based workforce. Um, other things, just the fact that uh, the production is so automated, like because Marx obviously did talk about automation in the Grandrissa, for instance, and... Um, so he, he explicitly writes that automation, the, the development of automation undermines the ability of the capitalist system to continue. Uh, what was the, sorry, what was the second part of the question in terms of a fully automated system? Uh, would a fully automated system then cease to be a capitalist system because it's no longer uh, extracting surplus value because even uh, aspects of a service economy can be automated, of course. Yeah, absolutely, and that will continue to happen under under a socialist mode of production. Um, yeah, it wouldn't. A fully automated uh, system of production cannot be capitalist. It has to be. It has to be socialist. Um, like you say, it would no longer be extracting surplus value at all. Um, you'd have a system of production whereby. Um, the ownership of the means of production could not be privately owned because no surplus value is being produced. So in Grossman's schema, um, he shows that the amount of um, surplus value being produced, so, so when he talks about an over-accumulation of capital, it's also an under-accumulation or an under-production of surplus value. So there's not enough surplus value uh, to, that can be dedicated to the accumulation of capital, wages, and the consumption fund for the capitalists. And in fact, the, the consumption fund for the capitalists is what disappears first, um, which, which makes the capitalist very aggressive uh, to, in, uh, and, um, in going, in trying to pursue the um, counter tendencies and depressing the, the, the wage of the labourer. But as I say, the more, you're right, a fully automated society can't be capitalist. I would add to that that it has to be socialist because it's the only alternative is uh, absolute slavery, but there wouldn't be any point because there, and, and I'm sure, look, look, I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to be honest, I'm sure there are parts of capital that are going to try and turn to slavery um, because they're not going to know what else to do, like as we saw with the Nazis. But um, aside from that, th there, there wouldn't really be any point because 
I mean, for one thing, slaves aren't very productive. They're very, very, very lethargic, which is one of the reasons the the, um, the Nazi system collapsed. But the the fully automated system of production would be producing everything you need. So you wouldn't need you wouldn't need a working class to exploit anyway. Ultimately, does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it does. That's why I asked the question. I thought that would be the case. Yeah, I mean, effectively, what we're seeing is the withering away of surplus value and exchange value, which leaves us with use value. So capitalism is a, ju a, a dualistic mode of production. Uh, the commodity is a use value and an exchange value. It's a, the, the capitalist mode of production is a labour process a technical labor process and a value creating value valorization process but the more uh capitalism develops the the harder it um finds uh the the the, the less surplus value it produces relative to the capital that needs to be um reproduced and so yeah what we're seeing is surplus value withering away exchange value withering away and that leaves us with use value now a, 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 a mode of production that produces only use values that's that's socialism or communism or whatever you want to call it that's what it is uh, Richard it becomes, a, it becomes a unitary mode of production rather than a dualistic one right so that's why I use the term pre-socialist quite a lot in, in my writing. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Richard Greeman, you're on stack. Go ahead. Well, I'm a, a bit confused, and I guess my question is how, from this point of view, can we explain the increasing inequality of, yeah. the, uh, of the world, of more and more billionaires occupying uh, owning more and more uh, of uh, and people being poorer and poorer and starvation and uh, yeah. and all the rest of these things it seems to be like going in both directions at once yeah that's right yeah it's um it's the counteracting tendencies you know their their capital is um is underproducing surplus value. So they have to get that surplus value from somewhere else. So they have to destroy their competition and they have to centralize wealth into fewer hands to sustain the profitability of their own wealth, uh, of their own um, companies and the value of their own personal wealth as well. So they will do that through the tax system they would do it through the stock market or, um, uh, you know, through speculation, which is, you know, a, glor a glorified version of gambling, really. Um, or, you know, the most, um, the largest version of gambling in the world that, that we have. Um, they will attack our wages. They will destroy capital that is no longer producing surplus value because it's a waste of money to spend any anything on it. All of the and all of these things will contribute to the growing inequality we're seeing. So this is where capitalism is breaking is breaking down. Um, it's breaking down for a portion of the of the population at, at a time. You know, for some people, capitalism is already broken down because they've been immiserated and, and lumpenized. But it's going to keep breaking down for more larger and larger sec sections of, of the population across the world. Because they, if, we're not, if we are no longer producing surplus value, they need to get it from somewhere else. So they'll get it by, um, you know, whatever way, whatever, whatever way they can. You know, um, a lot of people talk about the war on cash at the moment. So what's actually happening there? Well, they need to convert uh, cash into stocks. 
in order to lower the interest rate because the the interest rate is lowered um, by producing more loan capital. So, um, and you need to you need to um, lower the interest rate to make capital cheaper, so that people can afford to borrow it to keep the system going. So that that's the sort of thing that's going on. But all of the all of the the usual ways. Um, are becoming more and more difficult to to pursue, and yeah, so that that's these are the sorts of things that's happening, and um, you know they'll just they'll just they'll destroy anything that is surplus to requirements because they can't afford it. They can't afford it if they're going to sustain the profitability of their own companies and the value of their own wealth. So. I have other questions, but I would really like to hear from other people who are here. Uh, any one ready to ask a new question? <clears throat> you know, uh, Ted, you brought up volume two and volume three in Grossman's mind. And to what I look at as what has taken place in a really large way over the last 20 years or so, but it was beginning before this as well. I mean, the ATM machine, what does that go back to uh, the 70s or early 80s or something like that? But what we have seen is capital has re reduced the turnover time dramatically to get their yeah. returns. Now that's on our consumer end. They, they're not reducing that turnover time to such a degree on large capital investments such as huge machines, the huge robotics. However, there is enough being created and a lot of working class displacement going on. Just think of, I don't know how many banks there were in America 10 years ago and how many branches they had. But today you have a very hard time finding a, a bank that you can go to. It's all done in clicks on your phone and it's almost like we're wearing contact lenses when we walk into the various, uh, you know, the the various commodities we've been uh, lured into spending too much on, like coffee. That, uh, but while you're talking to the cashier, there's something being read on your shoulder pad or something where you're being paying already. Uh, but th this has had its limit, and that. That limit and where capital was taking back its cost of distribution to offset its decline in rate of profit, that is already wearing down on capital. At the same time, the, there, there is more and more hedging and, and uh, the, through financialization of international capital, there is tremendous profit taking based on predictions. They haven't even realized the profit yet, yet the capitalists are pulling profits for what they anticipate is 20, even 40 years down the road. Now, we learned that in the end, like Mark says in the end, their gold or the whatever the, the, whatever is representing money will be the, what is demanded at last resort. But I think that capitalists today feel there will be no demand of last resort. I mean, is the demand of last resort something with total automation? I don't think so. A countervailing to total this total automation is when intense manual labor becomes cheaper than investing in robots, people are put back to very degrading work. So, and, and we see that going on now. Uh, Foxconn was going to move into Wisconsin as long as the American workers would accept the same wage rate as the, what was impoverishing the workers in China. Yeah. That, that did fall down, but I do feel that capital will be pushing for wage rollbacks all over the planet, even with strong, in, inside nations with strong labor traditions like Germany or France. Uh, uh, so in any case, the, is this in some some ways related to your analysis? And maybe take my question, and Sharon has a question. Now, maybe you could take both at the same time. Go ahead, Sharon. Hi there. 
Um, Ted, I was wondering if you could have, if you have an idea of what it would look like on the ground. We're talking about wealth inequality of um, our wages being, you know, pushed lower and lower. Uh, we're talking about workers demanding, you know, um, more higher wages. What would it look like in the United States and then in other countries too? Does that make sense? I mean, it's kind of, I guess it's sort of like um, uh, fortune telling or something, but um, do you, do you have, mean what sections of the working class do I expect to to start rebelling? Yes, and what would it look like for other people, like the pe poor workers and people who are maybe aren't even working but are living totally on the margins and will just be getting worse and worse for people in the U.S. where more people are houseless and uh, it will reach like, um, you know, like a critical mass or, you know, there'll be a lot of um, repression. Yeah. Um, of course, there'll be repression, but I'm just wondering what that would look like just maybe in the U.S. and maybe, you know, the U.K. and Europe. Do you mean what a revolution would look like or just the, the fact that more and more people are getting poorer? Well, that that's a great question. What a revolution would look like. And also, um, what would be the segue into socialism? Um, will the capitalists just all of a sudden say, hey, we're not making any money. Well, let's quit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> Well, just, I, mean, I know we're talking about system and everything, but yeah. I'm just wondering what it might look like. Yeah, I mean, I can only, um, I can only, um, you know, guesstimate. I can only have a, an educated guess. Um, I think the the biggest, you know, reading uh, the last chapter of Grossman it was quite revelationary for me because. Um, I hadn't read it. It wasn't in the abridged version at all. And uh, it was only last year that the a fully translated English version was published by Rick Kuhn. Um, and um, the problem capitalism has is that it needs to, as, as you say, it needs to keep um, forcing down the wage the wages of the of the working class but despite all this automation there is still a um a large section of the working class that maintains all this automation and you know make sure it's in working order replaces the parts um does the coding for the most advanced types um you know, scientists are being proletarianized in a way that's never, never happened before, having their wages forced down. There has to, there, there has to come a point where the workers who are closest to the means of production get fed up with it um, and start rebelling. And of course, not only can capitalism um, not function without these workers, um, nor could socialism, because they are the people who have been trained to operate this, you know, the, the newest means of um, production. So having read the last chapter of Grossman, that's now um, where my thinking is. Um, you know, there, there, there comes a point where those workers are coming under the same sort of attack that the, the rest of the working class has already been subjected to. And that's when you, you will get um, a sort of tipping point in the, the balance of class forces and things will start to move in the other direction. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be very, very hard for a lot of people before we reach that point. I don't know exactly when that point's gonna, going to come, we are already already at zero interest rates across, you know, the the main imperialist countries, and to force uh, interest rates into negative territory, they're going to basically have to um, produce, you know, all these digital assets which can't be withdrawn from um, circulation, 
which will then that will enable negative interest rates but that will start to make the the bulk of the major banks unprofitable so you'll get another centralization in banking capital um to the point where there's very few banks if any other than the central banks um that's something that the libertarian right is banging on about but they're not wrong that that is something that's happening um and yeah so for everyone else um i think we're gonna have to start building you know is it there's that old uh black panthers saying about survival pending revolution and for a lot of the working class that's going to have to be what we do um you know we're going to have to pull resources um work together um build organizations functioning organizations that support each other um and so on and so forth um uh, you know and keep keep each other going what whilst agitating for the rest of the working class to um to join us but the reality is that they're more they're more likely to start joining with us when their own living standards are being crushed and they are starting to face um face um uh you know intolerable levels of repression so history is very cruel that's the way it goes um but yeah i think that's kind of what we can expect but but there's like like i said there's the 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 us treasury uh, officials in the us treasury uh, for the last decade have been have been saying that we a, a certain level of the debt ceiling is approaching where um we risk not being able to pay people who work for the state you know including soldiers um and that sort of thing so i don't know if there will be a crisis in the near future where they they literally can't afford the wages of the people who work for the state and as i say we have state monopoly capitalism now the state is very intermingled with um the largest corporations and that will that integration will only continue or if we get a crisis or or it maybe it will take a couple of cri- more crises before we get to that point i don't i can't say for sure but that's 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 what i see that's where i see a, a revolutionary situation probably occurring or during wars where you know the the soldiers get fed up with um the lack of support the lack of equipment the lack of food that they're receiving and so on and so forth which is what we saw in the past with the russian revolution we nearly saw it with vietnam or we began to see it with vietnam um you know it, there's all sorts of things can happen so it's it's very hard to tell but from from the point of view of of people who are getting poorer yeah we we're going to have to to build organizations su- to support each other absolutely thanks so much like mutual aid thank you very much yeah 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 definitely So I I know there are many more questions. Oh, you wanted me to talk about circulation? If you could. Yeah, so there's a dual there's a, again the um circulation works in both directions. On the one hand, you speed up the circulation of capital, the surplus value is getting back to you sooner, so you can valorize the capital sooner. But at the same time, the same innovations are reducing the amount of labor time that's being exploited. per commodity per laborer so again the counter tendency give, giveth and taketh away sort of thing um isaac we i don't he there's someone who just joined us who cannot hear he's trying to, i think he has to use his iphone i'll i'll text him but um it's interesting that you are talking about the end of banks because when one looks at microsoft apple google facebook they are all beginning their own internal banking operations and right. and, and the large 
of corporations are taking over the function that they were counting on finance capital from before. Mm -hmm. and, but this again will have, will reach its limit, I, I'm sure. Um, but if, do you have any comment on that phenomenon as it's been gaining speed? Yeah, Grossman made a point of, about this because um, Hilferding especially thought that the driving force in, in capitalism was the banks. Um, he saw the, the banks as, a social, as having a socialising function and he thought, you know, if you just seized, I think there's a quote like, if, you, if we seized the, the six largest banks and nationalised them, we would, we, would base, we would more or less have socialism. Um, but Grossman sees it the other way around. There's, there's a merging between industry and the banks, which Lenin, of, of course, um, talked about. But within that relationship, it's industry that is the dominant side, not banking. Um, and, and in fact, the largest industry uh, owners become less, increasingly less dependent on the, the credit from banks. They can start to sell finance. So that's been going on for over a century. But like you say, it's reaching a point where they're almost sort of completely independent of the banks. Um, because of course, they don't want to pay the banks any money. <laughs> because that's going to eat into their own surplus value, their own profits. Um, they don't want to pay the state or the banks. They don't want to pay taxation no, or, of course or, not. Or, or any interest of any, or service yeah. fees of any mm. kind, if they can keep they, it. They don't, they don't want to, but they increasingly can't as well. Mm. That's, that's, what, that's what reformists don't understand or, or don't want to understand. I, I don't know what it is, but they... You know, it's all very, um, it's the, the reformist, the reformist roads to socialism is, is an ethical, psychological theory um, based on justice. It's, that's not Marx's theory. I'm sure like emotional and psychological factors play a very significant role in the way history and, and revolutions unfold. Um, but the, the driving force is the economic necessity of, uh, of development. So, you know that I'm really surprised that the other Michael here hasn't asked. Michael, you're here so many times with loads of questions. Are you still with us? Or are you there behind that? That dark rectangle there in the on the screen. Hi, Michael. Um, I am reluctant to speak up because I haven't done the reading, ah. um, as it were. But I. Um, well, the book am, is out yet, Michael. So you could not have done the reading. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I haven't read Grossman. I haven't uh, really read the critiques of Grossman. I know that Andrew Kleiman has a, 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 a critique that he published last year. Um, and I know that Ted responded um, in some sense to him during uh, the, um, the Doug Lane show. Um, and I haven't, uh, I didn't even watch all of that. I do know that uh, I, I did catch the part where he said, uh, this is all kind of like a side thing. So I'm sort of reluctant to bring it up, but since you, uh, since you I know, did it, you're going since to you did it. it, I'm going to, yeah. I mean, I, I, I found it surprising that, that Ted mentioned that the climate might've been going into the, the, area that he was going to for reformist reasons, which I um, uh, was confused about. I mean, I, I always, what I appreciated about Andrew is that he says, you know, look, um, working people have to struggle for what they can get, um, but they need to be prepared for the fact that like labor is a cost. And if you are going to put that cost on the system, you are going to uh, set off, uh, you know, a, there will be a virulent reaction coming from capital. And, they, and then workers need to be prepared to confront the reaction. 
Um, and that's not what they will be prepared for if they've been led to believe, you know, the, the trickle up notion that what's good for the working class is good for capitalist America, that, that social democracy um, sort of sells. And that's not what Andrew, what I, what I've taken from Andrew's work. I guess if I had a question, I'd be curious to know if Ted is going to write something um, systematic in terms of like responding to Andrew. I could put the links into the chat. He also had um, in January a response to challenges and questions to the original article. So I'm curious to know if, if Ted's looked at that and I guess what his take is overall on the criticisms, not just maybe of Andrew, but of other people uh, dealing with Grossman um, over the years. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Um, yeah, I am planning to respond to Andrew Kleiman's article on, on Grossman. Um, I, don't, I don't know when I'm going to get around to it because it needs to be um, quite thorough. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that Kleiman's become an anti-communist or something like that, but like my, what I said in that interview was um, that my first instinct when anyone um, criticizes Grossman is that it's coming from a reformist, um, I don't want to say ideology or position or just, just a reformist reality whether they intend it to be that or not. Um, because um, all of the critics of Grossman when Grossman were, was alive were de facto reformists, whether it was, I mean, we're, I'm gonna and go, go on another tangent here, but whether it was the social Democrats or whether it was the communists in the, in the communist international, because although Grossman supported the Soviet Union and believed that it was socialist. He recognized that it had a reformist. He essentially recognized that it had a reformist foreign policy because it, it didn't have the capacity to spread socialism on its own without confronting the imperialist countries in very big wars, which it was, it was, its people were reluctant to do. You know, they wanted to, um, I suppose they wanted to enjoy the fruits of their own labour and, and get on with life. Um, but t so taking that aside, my my instinct is is that it's coming from a reformist angle, whether it's intended or not. Um, I think to say that Gross, because what Kleiman does is he says Grossman thinks he's he says Grossman thinks that he has shown that there is a breakdown tendency in Marx and in Bauer, but what he's actually done is something else. Um, and so what Gross, Grossman says that his models show an underproduction of surplus value, but Kleiman says that that's not what Grossman shows, even though that's what he thinks he's shown. He's actually, sh I think he says something about the physical an underproduction of physical commodities or it might have been an overproduction. I can't remember now. I, it was a while back since I read it, but that sounded to me like a disproportion, a disproportionality theory at the surface level rather than at the level of production, um, which is what Grossman is talking about. So, and then, um, I'm not sure I've read all of the responses to Kleiman, but he did an interview where he he agreed. I can't remember who was interviewing him now, but he agreed that 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 there isn't a breakdown tendency, but the ten, tendency towards stagnation. Um, but you know, I think that's kind of the same thing. Like what Grossman is doing is showing that the the schema breaks down that it can't continue on the terms that it started, started out with. So therefore you have to counter that breakdown in the figures uh, and, and start it up again that way, restart accumulation on a different basis that is more favorable to generating enough surplus value. 
So, I mean, yeah, it might feel, I suppose it might feel like the system's stagnating and it, it does stagnate. Wages have stagnated. Um, you know, that's part of the struggle though. You know, Grossman does talk about the effect of the struggle on the system as a whole. You know, it might feel like workers haven't fought back uh, militantly, but, you know, in, in, you know, at the negotiating table, like, you know, uh, when they're arbitrating over wages, that's, that's happening all the time. And workers are resisting to some degree um, the attack on their, 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 um, their living standards and their wages. And of course the capitalist only needs to go so far at a certain point in time. It, the capitalist will need to go further at a later point in time when the underproduction of surplus value becomes more acute. So, yeah, I mean, it's a stagnation and, and a breakdown. These things are both happening at the same time. But if, if, you, if you talk about capitalism only stagnating, then when does the impetus for a working class uprising come from? Because we all know that that's not happened for a long time. So why, if there is no objective change in conditions, would that suddenly happen? That, that would be a reformist um, uh, view of history. The, refor the socialist... Uh, the reformist road to socialism, as I said, was uh, driven by ethical and psychological concerns. So Kautsky, for example, believed that the working class would overthrow, would overthrow the, work, the ruling class because the ruling class is uncivilised, um, for example. Um, and other under-consumption theories basically come to the same conclusion the capitalists are too greedy they don't pay the um, workers enough for them to subsist um, so either they rise up because of under consumption because of because of greed um, or for ethical reasons because the capitalists are just too unethical to um, to put up with any longer but of course Capitalists become more unethical because it, it's becoming harder and harder for them to reproduce their, their own system um, because of the economic dynamic that, that Grossman has um, outlined. So that's, that's why I can't, um, that's why I, I use the word reformism when it, when it came to that. Okay, Ted. Oh. Questions from other people here? So Ted, could you tell us one, just in closing, how was it that you came about putting this book together? And give us a preview of what we would expect when we get to your book, when it comes out, when it, it comes out in May, you um, said? May 27th, yeah. You can pre-order it now with um, Zero Books. I'm going to write to Phoebe to see if she'll give us a, dis a slight discount code so that I can send to our <laughs> participants. Maybe she will. I don't know. But Zero Books is pretty good in their pricing compared to a lot of left publishers. But mm. again, I interrupted you. How did you come about with the idea to do the book? Uh, what went into it? What... Uh, are you going to follow up with a, a second volume on, on the thought of, of Henry Grossman? It's uh, a good idea. <laughs> um, so um, I was saying before we started, just about four years ago, I started an essay, a theoretical essay, um, and the, the main theme was automation. And a comrade called uh, Trevor Rawlsley, who sadly passed away recently, um, recommended that I read the abridged version of, of Grossman's Law of Accumulation and try and apply Grossman's theory to what I'd already done. And when I read 
uh, law, the law of accumulation, albeit being just the abridged version, I was blown away by its clarity um, because, you know, Marx is difficult. It is, is the theory is dense. It, it, it is a lot to get through. It, people, it's understandable that people make mistakes when reading Marx. Um, I found Grossman easier to read. I don't know if that's just because it was a, an abridged book, but I just think his style, um, obviously it's a translation, but I think it's a very good translation. Um, it's, uh, was um, Jairus Benaji who did the first translation and he worked with Rick Kuhn on the, um, the new translation of the full version that came out last year um, with Haymarket, I think. So yeah, I read that and then I was just hell bent on reading more Grossman and there's some, there's some of his essays are on Marxist.org um, and then luckily Rick was publishing more of Grossman's work um, that someone's recommended one of the um, one of Grossman's essays um, in, in the in the chat and that was um, translated and published by Rick who's an Australian Marxist um, so he's pu he's published a lot of Marxists uh, Grossman's economic work so I've read been reading that he's also published Grossman's letters to Paul Matic and to others from the Frankfurt School, um, which are very interesting politically. Um, so, so my book starts out with because uh, Rick's written a, a very thorough biography of of um, Grossman, which I recommend everyone read if they haven't already. It's very good, very enlightening, and so my book is a is a summary. There's, there's of the biography in a way summarizes um, Grossman's life. Um, the, so it starts out with, there's an introduction on the economic theory to sort of orient, orientate the reader to that so that they can get used to the ideas. Then there's a chapter on the early part of his life. Then I go into more detail on, on his book, Law of Accumulation and his breakdown theory why he felt the need to write it, uh, what it set out to do, who it was criticizing and so on. Then there's a chapter on the latter part of his life. Uh, he was exiled from Poland to Germany. And then he, he went to London, uh, Paris and New York. And then he eventually returned to East Germany. He didn't feel like he'd go back to Poland because he had family there who were killed by the Nazis. Um, so he went to East G Germany um, because there was a lot of anti-communism going on in the US by that point as well. And he became a lecturer at a university in East Germany. But he was never given the credit he deserved while he was in the Soviet Union um, or by the Soviet Union. And that's, you know, that's that's probably the number one reason why he's still so underread because the Soviet Union would have had a chance to really influence a lot of people um, by defending him and promoting his work, but they never did. Um, luckily, there are people like Rick and uh, uh, Jairus and... Um, and you. Amar Sheikh, yeah. Uh, Amar Sheikh um, was the first person to start reproducing Grossman's work or analysing Grossman's work in um, the, I think 1978 he produced uh, a history of crisis theory or an introduction to the history of crisis theory um, and that started to put Grossman back on the map then there was the abridged version came out, there's a communist in Britain called uh, David Yaffe who um, who was very keen on Grossman. He was uh, the leader of, a, he is the leader of a group called the Revolutionary Communist Group. That's the organization I was with when, when Trevor recommended I read um, Law of Accumulation for my essay. And yeah, it's just gone from that. And I, so my first book was called Socialism or Extinction, um, it, which cites 
a lot of Grossman, among others, um, and Ashley Frawley, who was working for Zero Books, read that book and suggested that I write this one. Um, it was she. The, the idea was that a, a, a shorter book than, than summarising uh, Grossman's life and work would fill a gap that hasn't been done yet uh, because obviously Rick's work is very comprehensive um, and Rick's publishing more work as well, more some of his lesser, even more lesser known stuff. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically it. And um, I would like to read more Grossman. He, 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 he wrote on other topics. Um, he wrote about the, the emergence of the, the modern scientific worldview, you know, and you can, he, he doesn't explicitly talk, use Marx in, in that, in that work, but you can see how he's using Marxism to explain that emergence, um, in, in a dialectical way. Um, based on things arising from the development of the economic technical basis of our social, of the present social formation, which in this epoch is capitalism, in the next epoch will be, will be socialism. Well, Ted, thank you very much. I, you, you've done quite a presentation. We, uh, you know, with, with my screw up at the beginning, you still got it done, and I <laughs> really appreciate it. So, thanks uh, very much. Thanks for having me on, and thanks everyone for coming and and for all of your questions.